The Gospel of Luke, we stopped in the middle of chapter 10. And the pivot point in this session is when he, for, when he foretells his death. He says, I want you to get this into your thick skulls. That's the JTS version. ESV says, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. The Bible says at that point that he sets his face like the flint onto Jerusalem. And so he's starting his journey, and that's where we left off. We also took a tour, and I wanted to come back and, and uh, revisit these things just to see if folks have questions, because uh, we have a very broad spectrum of Bible backgrounds we've got some folks that know it very very well some folks that uh when when the room is full that are just getting started and so i wanted to pause and ask if anybody had any questions or comments on uh, any of these topics we also talked about the three heavens again i think and we talked about the shift from lucifer to satan and i took out all the middle of the stuff and the conclusion was be sober, be watchful, your adversaries like a roaring lion. So chapter 10, we got into this outline, and we talk about ambassadors, neighbors, and worshipers. And right there is the line where we ended. So today we're going to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. you got to understand the geography to best understand the parable. There's the road from Jericho to Jerusalem or Jerusalem to Jericho, depending upon which way you're going. I will tell you when I drove that road, my ears popped, I don't know how many times. Because what you're doing is you're going from almost a half a mile above sea level to almost a quarter of a mile below sea level over the course of about 15 miles. So it's quite the road. There you see the road to Jerusalem on the left and that red circle, that's a bunch of pilgrims walking the pathway between the two. There's the highway, there's the pathway and the road is selected for this parable because it was dangerous not just to travel but also dangerous because of robbers. So the parable of the Good Samaritan, behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do, keyword, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So obviously, a lawyer and the law, he's throwing it back into his face. And uh, so you have a tester and a testee, but the two positions just got reversed. And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So what's the catch? You can't do it all. You can't do it all. Isaiah tells us all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But he, the lawyer, Desiring to justify himself, that's what he was in the process of doing because of the do word as opposed to the believe word. He was trying to justify himself. Trying to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man, he never says he's a Jew, but he has to be a Jew for the passage to work because of the bigotry and the hatred that was going on. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now I think it's interesting that the priest was going down the road. That tells me he just left the temple. It would be as if us just leaving church and feeling all good churchy and shaking hands and bless you and everything. And then we go out, and we have a quite a steep road right here. Somebody leaves right here and there's an accident or something. And you just go on. So there, there are parallels here. 
A priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, this is, comes from Ezekiel, and Ezekiel has some scathing words, particularly for the leaders of religious leaders. And he says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Now, I'm very thankful to be at Mount Vernon Christian Church. I'm very thankful that we have a pastor that is just dripping with love and dripping with energy. And I've said so many times, if he does one more thing for this church, we'll have to tie symbols to the inside of his knees and be a one-man band. But you think of the, the, uh, the accusation, the allegation here. You didn't strengthen the weak, which comes through preaching, comes through visitation. You didn't visit the sick. You didn't heal the brokenhearted. You didn't go after the strays. And you didn't preach to the lost. Sad to say there are a lot of churches that have this as an epidemic in their ranks. The priest, the Levite, they had their hearts hardened against one of their own people. That was a Jewish man. Maybe he was just coming back from the temple. We're studying Levitical sacrifices. Maybe he just got done praising the Lord and giving a burnt offering. Maybe he had a peace offering. He's going home. You know, when they go up to Jerusalem, they sing the Psalms of Ascent. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Maybe he was going up and maybe he had his sheep. Maybe he had a bag full of money that he had to trade in the temple to get a, a, a sheep, you know, worthy of sacrifice. And he gets clubbed over the head, stripped and left half dead. The Samaritan, we haven't been introduced to the Samaritan yet, he had his heart soft towards another people. There's bigotry in this story. There's religious discrimination in this story. And the call comes down to the question, who is my neighbor? But a Samaritan, not James or John in chapter 10. Now, uh, note James, and that's a, that should say note. Note James and John in chapter 10. What happened in chapter 10? Jesus was going through Samaria. The Samaritans wouldn't accept him. And they said, hey, how about we just call down fire out of heaven? So here we are just past that passage. And now Jesus is talking to this lawyer. But I think he had a message for James and John there as well. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, two days pay, and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. That's an interesting phrase, when I come back, because we're going to go through all these different characters and the good Samaritan is Jesus. And the innkeeper is us. And he's saying, take care of the brokenhearted. Take care of those that are half naked. Take care of all those people until I return, until I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So now we go over to what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Obviously, I've got some heavy editing to do if I'm going to put this out on YouTube, right? <clears throat> what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? There was this lawyer. He's trying to justify himself. He thought he had faith but he did, definitely did not have works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled. Have a great day. God bless you. Without giving them the things needed for the body, 
What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know, Jesus said that the devil was the liar and the father of lies and the truth was not in him. But he did say some things because when he addressed Jesus, he addressed him as the Holy One. He knew who he was and he was, I hate to say scared to death because they're immortal spirits, but he knew who they, they, they were and they were afraid. So the Good Samaritan and the characters, the traveler, the robbers, the priest and the Levite, the Good Samaritan and the innkeeper. The traveler, that was me before I was saved. The Bible tells me that I was a child of wrath, even as others. I was dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible tells us that he was half dead, but I was spiritually 100% dead. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The robbers, that was the demon, that was the world. The world tried to snuff my life out of me before I had. I'm so thankful God allowed me to live long enough to be saved. I should have been dead many, many times over. The priest and the Levite, the law of Moses has no compassion. We're going through the Levitical sacrifices. I'm going to spare you all the 613 mitzvahs, but there is no compassion in the law. There's no escape clause. There is no loophole. The Bible says if your kids are disobedient, you should stone them. Well, if they were 100% adherent, observant to the law, there'd be no generations. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. The law gives no relief. And the law just continues on its way. The Samaritan, that's Christ. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Jesus didn't run into anybody that he didn't fix. And number six, the innkeeper. That's us. We're supposed to take care of those people until Jesus comes back. So the key points. Knowledge of the law is useful. The Bible says the law is the schoolmaster of sin. Those who profess the most don't necessarily love the most. Do good to all people, including your enemies. Of course, that begs the question, why are they your enemies in the first place? Which brings us to Martha and Mary. And you know, I, for the longest time, had the toughest way, the toughest time trying to keep Martha and Mary straight in my head. But I finally figured it out. Martha is toiling hard always, T-H-A. So if you have the same problem I do, you can't take Martha and Mary and figure one out from the other. Toiling hard always. So Martha and Mary. Now, as they went on their way, they entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed or received him into her house. King James says receive, and the reason I put the King James in there is I wanted to draw your attention to John 1.12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, as you're studying these different epistles, or I'm sorry, you're studying these different gospels, and you have Matthew's flow, and you've got Luke's flow, uh, trying to put together a chronology is sometimes difficult. And... Martha and Mary lived in Bethany. Bethany is very close to Jerusalem. And some would say, well, Jesus made his way down. If, they're, if you're taking Luke's gospel as pure chronology, he made his way down. He's going up the, the road from Jericho up to Jerusalem. He's using that as a prop to tell his story. And he comes to Bethany. The problem is in Luke chapter 17, he's back down in the other direction somewhere. So you can't count on these things being chronological. She also had a sister called Mary. Now, King James adds the word who also sat at the Lord's feet. 
So now, because that word also is there, and we'll get to the next click and you'll see where also has merit. Here you have Mary and Martha, and they both want to sit and they want to listen to Jesus, but Martha has this need to deal with the physical. Martha has this need. She's got this, she's overflowing with the gift of hospitality. She wants to take care of everything, but yet a little bit of sibling jealousy there. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted. So obviously she was listening, but she was distracted. So the two of them should have been sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, Jesus doesn't have to have meals, you know, like every so many hours. You remember Jesus said in the woman at the well, he sent the apostles in to go get him something to eat. And they came back and he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. He was feasting on spiritual food. And I don't know about you, but I've been involved in Bible studies where it's just was gone hour and hour and hour. And next thing you know, it's two o'clock in the morning. Say, we, we better go to bed. I guess that's a good reason to do it here because everybody has to go back to their own houses. Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her. Notice double. Martha, Martha, she's trying to soothe her feathers. You are anxious and troubled about many things. And John in chapter 14 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He said, Martha, you're troubled with many things. And what Jesus was trying to do, he was trying to say, you know, peace. The, the, the hippies have given us the, the, the peace sign, but Jesus has given us real peace. There was a generation, I think it was probably before mine, when a testimony would be, have you made your peace with God? And people would know what that meant. If I said that to a millennial, if you have you made your peace with God, they would have no clue what I'm talking about. But I think Martha knew. But one thing is necessary. One thing has necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, put your Martha hat on. You're wanting to mash the potatoes and do everything else that has to be done. And Jesus, look up there in verse 40. Tell her to help me. And he says, her place is not going to be taken from her. Where, where does that leave Martha? Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listening to his teaching. That's where we are right now. But this particular Mary, and there are many Marys in Scripture. It's like there are a lot of James in Scripture. There are many Marys in Scripture. But this particular one, every time you find this Mary, you find her at the feet of Jesus. And this is the, the, the se section we just covered. Then in John 11, this is when Lazarus is dead. Jesus tarries for a couple days, and he comes back. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. So Jesus is coming. Mary is mourning her brother, probably disappointed because Jesus hadn't come, probably frustrated. We don't know what the mixed emotions are because grieving is something that is very, very individual. She fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died at his feet again. So then the next chapter, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with, his, with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So, Mary and Martha. That concludes chapter 10. Chapter 11, there's the outline, the Lord's Prayer. I went through and did a spell check, and for some reason, Beelzebub, which is the word that I always thought was the word, ESV, I think, uses Beelzebub with an L. And before I knew it, all those L's got changed to B's, so I have no idea which one it is, but we're just going to go through it, okay? 
the Lord's Prayer. Familiarity breeds contempt. I grew up in a Catholic church. I grew up before the ecumenical movement. I had to recite the Lord's Prayer in three different languages, and everyone was a lie because he wasn't my father. Jesus looked at those Pharisees and he said, you are of your father, the devil. Contempt, the familiarity breeds contempt. My dad was a funeral director. And they would say the rosary, the vast majority of his clientele were Catholic. And they rattle through those beads. Familiarity breeds contempt. So when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, it's not say after me, like an open sesame or a hocus pocus or anything like that. It's a model prayer. It's a prayer that comes and says, these are the things you need to be thinking about if you want to get God's attention. The Lord's Prayer. Does anybody remember the Anvil Inn, Kenneth Square? Do you know where TJ Maxx is on the left? Okay, you go down the hill and there's a traffic light and there's a CBS. And there's a parking lot. Byler Campbell has a building in there. That used to be the Anvil Inn. And just beyond the Anvil Inn to the right is the Kenneth Square Missionary Baptist Church. And I visited the Kenneth Square Missionary Baptist Church, and they were praying that the Anvil Inn would shut down. And I'm sitting there thinking, there are more cars on that lot than this lot. That'll never happen. Well, don't you know the Anvil Inn is now a parking lot? The story's told about a church that prayed for a bar to be shut down. It's not the Anvil Inn. This is just a story. And sure enough, lightning strikes and destroys the building. And the owner of the bar takes the church to court. And they said, it's the church's fault that my building was struck by lightning. Well, the church hired an attorney to try to prove that it wasn't the church's fault. And the judge said, no matter how I rule on this case, one thing is true. The bar owner believes in prayer and the church doesn't. The Lord's Prayer. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. They did not say, teach us a prayer. Teach us how to be praying men. As John taught his disciples, and there you see from chapter 5, and the Pharisees said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. The people knew that John's disciples were praying persons. I have no reason to believe that they weren't authentic. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Keep in mind, Jesus said that when you pray, you're not to be praying to be seen of men. But it was well known that John's disciples were praying people, and they're saying, we'd like to be praying people also. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Now, I have revolutionary there. Because you study from, in the New Testament, you, Zacharias, you've got Mary, you've got Simeon, all the way back through the Old Testament. None of those prayers address God as Father. And these guys were schooled in the scriptures. They all went to elementary school, so to speak. And the very first word out of Jesus' mouth when he's teaching them to pray is to say, our Father. Then hallowed be your name. Later on, we're going to click through this and take every one of those verses and say, you can't call him Father if, you can't call him hallowed if, and you can't be hoping for the kingdom if. But we'll get to that. Give us each day our daily bread. Now that's a hard one to say when I've got loaves of bread sitting on the counter and refrigerator stuffed with food and leftovers from New Year's Day. So obviously, 
This is saying something different. The Bible says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So the essence of prayer is to be sincere, not to be seen of men. We talked about that already. It's to be brief. Jesus said, you don't want to be babbling like the pagans do. But now there's, there's, there's a two-edged sword here because on the one hand, we're not to repeat and babble and carry on and carry on, but yet the Bible says to pray without ceasing. We're going to learn that we're to pray persistently. So what does that really mean? What does it mean to wrestle with God? Jacob physically wrestled with God. It was a, the ultimate in prayer. Sincere, brief, definite. God knows what we need. The prayer shows whether our wish is in accord with his. James says, you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. I think we'll get to James in a little bit. Simple. 49 words. Forgiving as we forgive those. One of my favorite verses is, it, is in Ephesians, because I like that word, tenderhearted. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And practical. Must present real needs. Reverent. Must recognize the divine on which we are dependent. Now, that also is tricky because the Bible says that we're supposed to, we're, we're, we're to be able to go to the throne, King James says, boldly. Well, I like the modern word, it's confidently, because to me, bold would mean almost irreverent. To go with confidence. The Bible tells us in Romans that by faith we have access. That curtain was ripped from top to bottom, and we have access and lead us not into, too tempta into temptation. I wish Willie were here because he wrestles with the notion of temptation. And James says that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth thee any man. Uh, but that word temptation is a neutral word. It doesn't necessarily mean tempt to evil. It's, it's a trial. And lead us not into temptation. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say he is tempted. I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We're going to get to Abraham and Isaac in a little bit, but it's, he's on my mind right now. God doesn't tempt us to evil. That's what these verses read. And yet, God said to Abraham, kill your own son Isaac. That's an attempt to evil. The benefit that we have, we've got the whole scripture. If I hear this voice that says, kill your son, it's not God because his son died once for all. The Bible tells us that Abraham, by faith, now I can't get my head around this, maybe you can help me. Abraham, by faith, believed that Isaac would be raised. He believed that if he's going to drop that knife, Isaac is coming back, because Isaac, of course, is a picture of Jesus Christ. But he didn't know that. Then desire, when it's conceived, brings, forth, brings birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. God does not tempt anyone to do evil. I just talked about Abraham. But he does permit tests to come into the lives of believers. There you see Job. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Well, Job wasn't tempted to do anything evil. Maybe they had some whisperer tell me, might as well take your life. I mean, the, the wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? 
but there's no other than that there's no suggestion of job just giving up he that was that was like the in my mind one of the ultimate trials that's in scripture but here's abraham by faith abraham when he was tested offered up isaac and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Each of us have sons in this room. I can't imagine. So let's play mind games. Mary said to Jesus, said, I'm the way that he said, I'm the resurrection of life. He that believeth me shall live even though he might die. Right? So if Mary's got that. Why don't I just do myself in and I'll be alive again. That's just like the tempting of the, the devil with Jesus on the pinnacle. And he said, Jesus said, yeah, you, don't, you don't mess with that. Choose life. The book of Deuteronomy says, choose life. But that trial, Abraham was quite the man. I don't know what I would do. So I just mentioned it'd be unthinkable for any of us to give up our son. But God gave up his son. Talk about the love. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We've, we started studying Moses. I don't know how many months we were in Moses. And we kept coming. We said they were in that desert so they would be humbled and they would be tested. No temptation has taken you that is not common to man. God, you don't understand. I have this temptation. God, you don't understand. Well, God understands. He's been in this business since, since Adam and Eve. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Again, we're going to come back to the Lord's Prayer and pull all this stuff together. Our part. Here it is. I cannot say our, our father, if I live only for myself. I cannot say father if I do not endeavor each day to act like his child. Otherwise, that prayer would be hypocrisy. I cannot say hallowed be your name if I'm playing around with sin. I cannot say your kingdom come if I'm not allowing God to already be reigning in my life. You know that prayer, your kingdom come? I'm convinced that's the millennial reign. That's praying for God to come back. The book of Revelation ends, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And that's what that prayer is all about. Give us this day our daily bread if I'm trusting in myself instead of in God's provision. It's hard to pray that prayer if I think I'm in control of this thing. I've got everything under control. It's hard to say, or I cannot say, forgive us our sins if I'm nursing a grudge or withholding forgiveness from someone else. That's a hard prayer. You this one slide, if there's anything we walk home with from tonight, it's this one slide. I can't say that prayer if my mind and my heart are not in the right place. And I cannot say, Lead us not into temptation if I'm deliberately tinkering with sin. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Tom Martin several weeks ago gave us an interesting admonition. And he talked about prayer. And he mentioned, you know, so many times it's almost habitual that we end the prayer in Jesus' name. And he suggested, why don't you, every once in a while, and the prayer with this. For thine is the kingdom. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, the power and the glory, now and forever. And he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say, friend, let me three loaves, three loaves of bread. Now, he didn't ask for one. He didn't ask for two. He didn't ask for three. Well, he did ask for three. And the friend, the one that's in, in bed, it wasn't like you have a house and you've got a room, master bedroom, and you've got a room for the kids, and you might have a guest room. They had 
a room. We're going to see that shortly. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. There they are lined up. My children are with me in bed. And here's this guy beating on the door. And if the man was in bed by himself, he probably wouldn't answer the door. But this guy's beating and he's thinking, if you keep that up, you're going to wake these kids. We know they didn't have a dog because that would change the whole story, right? The dog would carry on. He will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Actually, he probably would get pretty aggravated before he does get up. But because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And you know, this is leading up to ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. So consider, necessity drives bold prayer. If you're between a rock and a hard spot, your prayers change. I have a prayer request for you. I just heard of a family, empty nesters, we're all empty nesters. The husband, the wife, and the mother-in-law all live together. In the past two weeks, they all found out that each has advanced stages of cancer. Necessity drives bold prayer. Now, I'm praying for those folks, but I'm thinking they're praying a whole lot harder than I am. It's just a necessity. It's just the way it is. But Merry Christmas, you're all going to die. Necessity drives bold prayer. The need in this case wasn't for the individual, it was for his friend. It was an intercessory prayer. The man already had an established friendship. He, was, he went to his friend's house. He didn't go to anybody and just beat on the door and say, hey, how about some bread? There was a relationship there. We should recognize the stark contrast between the man in bed. Oh, that should be a capital G. I'm so sorry. We should recognize the stark contrast between the man in bed and God. It's not a comparison. It's a contrast. Friendship shifts to sonship. And I tell you, and there you go. You get to see the A and the S and the K are all in red. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you? See, we just shifted from asking your friend to asking your dad. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? I can't imagine. No. My kids know when it's mealtime. And if for some reason it's late, we all have jerky schedules and this and that. I never had one of the little guys come to me and say, oh, father, may I please have something to eat? It's, dad, I'm hungry. That's a father and a sonship. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, dad, I'm hungry, will he instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. James tells us, every good and every perfect gift cometh down from above. John tells us, you can't receive anything unless it comes from above. Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, I highlighted that because there's a parallel to this in Matthew's gospel. And Matthew doesn't mention the Holy Spirit. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So ask and seek and knock. James says, ask, but you don't get. Because you're asking improperly. You ask amiss to spend it on your passions. Seek. 
Without faith, is it, impos it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Where do we look for God? Somebody might say, well, he's in nature. Somebody might say he's in the peace of this building. I look for God in his holy word. He rewards those who diligently seek him. There's a book, the title is misleading. I don't want to uh, justify the title. It's called Fierce Conversations. It has nothing to do with how, what we think of the word fierce. But anyway, the punchline of the entire book is the conversation is the relationship. It's a secular book. It talks about business. The conversation is the relationship. When I'm reading my scriptures, that's God talking to me. And when I'm prayer, that's me talking to him. And the conversation is the relationship. If you're not talking, you don't have a relationship. He says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek them. Knock. Now, this is going in the other direction. Jesus is doing the knocking on this particular verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. So here's me, here's the door, and here's Jesus, okay? If I knock, you think he's going to open the door? He absolutely will. He never turned anybody away. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's Jim Hur's favorite verse. And Jim would say, I did, and he did. I did delight myself in the Lord, and he did provide Jim the desires of his heart. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. There are three reactions here. There's amazement, the people. There are the Pharisees that gave the credit or tried to give the credit to Satan. And there are other people that say, well, that was a great act. Give us some more. Give us some more signs and wonders. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Pharisees needed to know where he got his power, but instead of looking up, they looked down. John 11. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. They had to come up with an answer. They couldn't say this is all a charlotte, and they couldn't say this is a fake. There are people that have been sick all their lives. There have been uh, demon-possessed people that were demon-possessed from their childhood. They couldn't deny this stuff happening. They had to come up with an answer. And so instead of looking up, they looked down. While others to test him kept seeking from a sign from heaven. Well, duh, what do you think that was? But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and the divided household falls. Now, I'm going to pause here and talk a little bit about politics. Our country is in deep doo-doo because we are so divided. People are even talking about national divorce, split the thing. We are in trouble. And unless we come to God, we're going to go continue down the slippery slope. I don't think I'm ever going to have an opportunity to vote for a perfect candidate. But I can certainly pray for a person in office to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, my, my flesh says, listen to people like Rush Limbaugh. But my spirit says, pray for our rulers. I'm stuck betwi betwixt and between. And our nation's in trouble. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, that is telling me that there were some other casters, some other exorcists. You say, well, how can that be? Let's go back to Moses. The power of the occult is heavy duty. 
Those Egyptians, they turn sticks into snake, they turn water into blood. And then ultimately when it came time for the gnats, they said, this is the finger of God. And we're gonna see the phrase finger of God come up here and again, Jesus wasn't involved with just the, the dunces of the nation. He was talking with the cream of the crop. And when you say finger of God, they knew exactly what was going on. There we have in Acts 19. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I drew you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. There were exorcists there. Were they phonies? I don't know. Could they have been real? Possible. Like I said, the power of occult. You say, well, how could his kingdom be divided against itself? If somebody, a false preacher, is doing those things and causing people to go to that person instead of going to God, then Beelzebub isn't really divided against himself. That's exactly what he wants to see have happen. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That phrase, finger of God, only shows up in those three scenarios. Uh, Exodus 8, there's another verse, but it's just it's the scenario. So there were gnats on the man and beast, and then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. In Exodus 30 8 and 31. And he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on the Mount Sinai two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, of stone written by the finger of God. Moses, 1500 years, Jesus, Jesus is saying, if the finger of God is involved, then the Messiah has arrived. The Pharisees, the priests, the high priest, they should have known, but they didn't. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now, we covered that verse in earlier chapters about the with me or against me. But there's an interesting picture here. Satan is no wimp. The Bible calls him the prince and the power of the air. And he's guarding his rights. He's guarding what he's got with all of his strength. Ultimately, he's going to lose the battle. But his goods are safe if we choose not to fight with them. If you don't want to be bothered by the devil, just stop living for the Lord. Let your Bible gather dust. Stay at home Sunday mornings. Turn on country music instead of, uh, instead of WDAC or whatever else. And you'll find yourself just no problem at all. Life will be so sweet. 